In this video, we're going to be restoring a rare electric motor made by the Emerson Electric Company. This motor dates to about early 1900s. Uh, one way that you could date it is the motor is rated to run on 104 volts as opposed to 110. So uh, the switch over to 110 occurred somewhere around the year 1910. Uh, so we know that this motor is definitely older than that. Uh, the motor weighs about 105 pounds. It's a one half horsepower. Uh, there's a number of things wrong with this motor. Uh, first of all, one of the bolts is snapped off in the housing here. The terminal block up here, which holds all your connections, is completely destroyed. Uh, so we're going to have to fabricate another one uh, to replace it. This one was made out of like a plaster type material. Uh, also, when you're restoring a, a rare motor like this, uh, I'm going to try to preserve as much of this motor as possible as far as the patina. Um, you know, I, I don't want to take it apart and completely repaint it and destroy it. This motor is really rare and uh, we want to try to preserve it as much as possible. So um, we're going to try to do more of a conservation rather than a complete teardown and a restoration. Um, so anyways, hope uh, you're going to enjoy following along and uh, we'll get this thing running again. Uh, it doesn't have a power cord attached to it, so um, it's, it's not running uh, at this very moment. Uh, this type of motor does have a, uh, it has like a clutch inside of it, which is uh, very unusual. So what happens is when you do power it up, the rotor gets up to speed, and after the rotor reaches a certain RPM, uh, a centrifugal switch engages, and then the shaft starts turning. Uh, that helps to give the motor a little bit more starting torque, a little more inertia um, before the shaft kicks in. So it's a really fascinating uh, design. So looking forward to taking this apart and uh, conserving it for uh, future generations to enjoy. Okay, so one thing I forgot to mention in the beginning was a piece of the face is also uh, snapped off, so that's not really a big deal, but I'll take care of that later. So before I uh, start doing anything with this, uh, prior to turning on the camera, I took about uh, 20 photos just of this uh, terminal block section. Uh, taking photos on any restoration project is really important because I've never restored a motor or anything like this before. I have no idea what's involved with it. Um, and there's a lot of pieces, and a lot of the pieces look similar. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to take this apart, and I'm going to number uh, the wires, and uh, we're going to put the uh, screws and the terminal blocks in the bag, uh, and we're going to tag them so that uh, later on, when it comes time to put this thing back together, we'll have a better idea of what goes where.
Okay, so we got the terminal block uh, disassembled, got everything tagged and uh, bagged. Now I'm going to begin removing the rear end bell. Uh, in order to make that easier, I need to clean up the shaft a little bit because it's a little bit uh, marred up from uh, some set screws. So I'm going to clean that up, which hopefully uh, will make that sliding off a little bit easier. Okay, these uh, bushings have a ring oiler that uh, picks up oil and uh, keeps the shaft lubricated. It's a nice design. And this bushing, it's really in fantastic condition, which is uh, pretty amazing uh, given the age of the motor. It shows you how well uh, these things were engineered. There's almost no play in that thing at all. Excellent. That saves me the trouble of having to put a new one on there. Now we're going to turn it around and uh, we'll do the other side. Okay, so we got the bushings out, and uh, the bushings are in good condition. Uh, after looking at them more closely, it's obvious that uh, somebody had been inside here. Uh, somebody who was in here must have been a, a butcher in a previous life, because uh, this thing is kind of marred up from uh, where somebody was doing some grinding on here. I'm not sure exactly what they were uh, trying to do, but they ended up drilling and tapping some new holes in here. And uh, also, this bushing had been bored out uh, on a lathe and a new insert in there, so that's why that one, uh, that's why they're fitting so well. Um, what I don't understand is these ring oilers were in there, but they weren't doing anything. Uh, this screw right here is supposed to keep the ring oiler in place, but they had it so that the ring oiler was sitting on top of the screw, which uh, means it wasn't, it wasn't doing anything because it wasn't riding on the shaft. And uh, these things were not filled up with any oil, so um, when we put it back together, we'll take a closer look at that and uh, see if we can get these ring oilers operating the way that they uh, the way that they should be operating. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to clear off the uh, work area here, and then we're going to uh, do a electrical test on the windings themselves, and this test is called a Megler test. So uh, let me get this area cleared off a little bit and uh, we're going to uh, hook up the measure.
All right, so the uh, the mega reading was good. Uh, it read about 20 mega ohms. Uh, what the mega does is it puts a high voltage uh, through the windings. This one puts about 500 volts, and uh, basically it tells you uh, how good the insulation is on these windings. Uh, this is a more conclusive test than a resistance test. So, uh, anyways dirt and moisture will affect uh, the readings on the mega. So hopefully after we get these uh, windings cleaned up a little bit and dried out, um, the reading will be even better than it was uh, just a few minutes ago. But this is a good reading. Um, the windings on this thing are in good shape. So uh, I'll be able to sleep a little bit easier tonight. When I uh, removed this shaft, uh, there was about six fiber washers uh, on the end of it. Anytime that you're disassembling uh, one of these motors and you find those fiber washers, make sure you take care of them. Uh, they're real important because they control the axial play in the shaft. So um, I have had already bagged those up. So now uh, the next step is going to be uh, we're going to start cleaning up these windings. and. Uh, working on the wiring in here. I don't think I mentioned earlier that this motor is a six pole. So you can count the windings here, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that means that this motor runs at approximately 1180 uh, revolutions per minute. So um, generally speaking, if you have two motors of the same horsepower, and one of them is a two pole motor running at 3,500 RPMs, and the other one is a four pole motor running at 1750 or a six pole motor like this one running at 1200 and they're all a half horsepower the motor with the lower rpms and more poles will generally speaking have more torque um, but anyways i'm going to begin the process of cleaning up these windings uh, we're going to be very gentle while we clean these uh, these things are probably about 120 years old i'm going to use a little bit of uh, crc uh, electronic cleaner. This is specifically made for electronics so it's not going to hurt the uh, the varnish that's already on the windings or anything like that. It's pretty gentle um, and it dries quickly. I'm also going to use a very soft uh, paintbrush, nothing hard at, at all like that. Um, so we're going to spray this up a little bit and uh, gently start to clean off the, uh, the dust and the grease that's on here. here, if you look where I have these uh, blue arrows pointing, uh, these are the leads from the start windings uh, to the top of the motor. Uh, if you can see right here, there's only one strand of wire there uh, that, that goes to these uh, start windings. So right here and right here is very, very delicate. So uh, we want to be sure that when we're cleaning that, we don't hit that and break it. So the start windings here are very fragile. Cleaning this, I'm being careful not to hit that, uh, that start winding. Inside the uh, stator here, Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, uh, the base off of here.
Other thing that I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take off the nameplate. So far, so good. Um, before we re-varnish these, we will uh, apply a little heat to this with the, either a heat gun or a heating pad and let them dry out real good. Um, and then uh, we'll put the varnish on. Also, I want to figure out a way to provide a little bit of protection to these uh, start windings because it would be really easy for somebody in the future to uh, damage those accidentally because they're so uh, fragile, hanging out there kind of uh, precariously. So. We'll figure out a way to get those insulated a little bit better and uh, hopefully they won't get broken in the future. Okay, before I get too much further into this uh, project, one thing that needs to happen is there's a bolt that's broken off here in the housing. So uh, I'm going to uh, spray a little bit of liquid wrench on there and uh, hopefully we could just loosen that up and uh, remove it easily. The reason why I have this uh, blue tape here is because I don't want the uh, liquid wrench getting on the windings. Now what I'm going to do is just take a pin punch. I'm just going to tap it a little bit just to try to uh, break it free if there's any rust or anything like that on there. drift and see if I can uh, get this thing moving and it, it did move so that's good and success. Okay, success. The, uh, the next step in the project is I want to try to move these lead wires I want to bring them out through the grommet that's here and uh, get them over in this area so that I can work on them and uh, get them repaired so in order to do that I'm going to take a heat gun and I'm going to heat this area up not too hot but what I want to do is I just want to soften the insulation on these old wires because over the years it just gets really stiff so and there's some uh, friction tape on here so I'm going to take a heat gun going to gently heat the area, soften up those wires, and carefully try to move them out of there. Hopefully uh, we won't break anything. While I'm using the heat gun to uh, soften the insulation here, 
I'm also kind of going around the windings a little bit just to dry these out. So um, before I put the insulating varnish on there, it's nice to have these warm and dry. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm attaching new leads uh, to the wires for the terminal block. So I've got these wires out here, I've got each one marked, and now I'm tracing them back to where I got some good wire to work from, and I'm soldering on uh, some new leads. This wire that I'm using here is a period correct uh, cloth covered wire, it's black, just like what was on there originally. So uh, like here, I got it soldered up, and then I'll cover the soldering joints with some heat shrink tubing, and after that, just for look, I'll put a little bit of friction tape on there because that's similar to the tape that was on there originally. So we'll try to keep it looking uh, as original as possible. Okay, so I've gone ahead and I followed each one of the leads all the way back. I used the heat gun to soften up the insulation. I carefully pulled them out of the grommet here. I followed each one of them back. There was a total of four of them. And then I went ahead and I soldered on the uh, fabric covered wire. So here's the job after it's finished. You can see it looks very neat. And also it looks a lot like it did uh, before I started. Uh, I used the fabric wire and I also used the uh, linen tape on there to give it an appearance just like I did uh, before I started. And also while I was at it, I attached new leads to the switch and removed this gasket. I'm assuming that this gasket was to uh, contain the oil in the oil bath. So that will have to be replaced. Okay, so I have the motor all masked off here, uh, just so we don't get the insulating varnish uh, where we don't want it. I had the motor sitting underneath a heat pad all night. So I, at night time, I put a heat pad over it and put a towel over there just to keep the, uh, the windings warm and dry. Um, as far as the insulating varnish is concerned, there's a couple different products. For this motor, I'm going to use this clear spray. It's made by a company called Spray On. Uh, it's available on Amazon or eBay and this product is also very good it has a red color it's made by MG chemicals it's called glip call and uh, this one is a brush on variety but for this project we're going to use the clear spray and then after I spray the windings I have a little uh, heater here I'm just going to put the heater on the motor not to get it hot but just to keep it warm and dry and uh, I'll kind of rotate the motor around so that it has a uh, even heat on it and then after a while we'll give this a second coat.
I'm just going to uh, leave the heat around here for a while while this dries. Every uh, 20 minutes or so, I'll just kind of rotate this around and make sure it gets heated well on both sides. After this is dried, I'll just give it a uh, another coat off cam. Okay, so right here I have some parts soaking in uh, some evapo rust. I have the hardware for the terminal block and also the uh, base. And you can see what I've done here is I've taken a heating pad and I've placed it underneath uh, this tray which has the parts soaking in it. I found that evapo rust works a lot better if it's a little bit warmer. So by putting the heat pad underneath there, you really cut down on the amount of time it takes for the evapo rust to do its thing. Uh, if I had a large bath of evapo rust, you know, 20 gallons or more, I would use a little heater from an aquarium to uh, warm it up because it really makes a big difference. Okay, so here I have a reference photo showing what the original terminal block looked like. The original terminal block was made out of a plaster type material. I've decided that I'm going to replace that with a material called micarta. This material is the same. Uh, that they used to make knife handles out of. It's a durable material. It would even be better than wood, for example, which could also be used. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm in the process of laying out the holes for the terminal blocks up here. So what I've done is I've used a transfer punch and uh, started laying out these holes. So the next step is going to be to drill these out. Uh, some of them have to be countersunk. These holes will be for the wires to come out from underneath and also on the original, uh, the edges were chamfered and the corners were rounded off, so we will do that also uh, to keep it looking uh, as original as possible. There's also some lettering on here that was stenciled on, and uh, after everything is finished, we will recreate that as well. Okay, so now I'm going to start knocking the edges off of the terminal block. And in order to do this, I'll be using a uh, mid-1930s uh, belt disc sander made by Herbert's Machinery. Uh, this machine actually belonged to my grandfather, and it's been in the family for uh, at least 70 years. The motor which powering it is a, a Delco, and uh, one of the videos on my channel you could see where I restored that. So anyways, we're going to go ahead and uh, knock off the edges on the terminal block. Okay, now we're going to begin disassembling the uh, rotor. Uh, before I started uh, over here, I took a bunch of pictures with the phone uh, just to kind of document where everything goes. Uh, just upon initial observation, I can see that uh, these springs look like they're going to need to be replaced. They're worn out. I can see that these contacts here are kind of marred up, so it uh, looks like that's going to need to be reshaped a little bit. We want to make sure that this thing is making nice contact with the uh, other part of the switch. So I'm going to go ahead and start taking this apart and um, 
see how it goes. Okay, now I have the uh, rotor disassembled uh, down into its main components. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start cleaning up each part, and then we're going to focus on that switch, uh, the contacts on there, getting those in better condition and replacing the springs on there. Uh, but I'll start off just cleaning the other parts, giving them a general tightening up. So I'm cleaning up the screws uh, from inside the rotor. A lot of them were pretty marred up, so uh, it looks like somebody had been in there taking those screws in and out a number of times. I chased those screws through a tap, or excuse me, through a die, and I got those cleaned up, the threads, and now uh, using this sterret hand vise, I'm using this fiber wheel here and just buffing out the heads a little bit. Not trying to make them look like brand new, but just kind of 
cleaning them up a little bit. And this stair vise comes in real handy for holding these screws. And this motor, by the way, is a 1920s Ohio motor, so uh, it's a nice little motor in itself. I never showed this motor on video before. Okay, so now the rotor is finished. Uh, I went ahead and I replaced these springs on each side of the switch here. Uh, the original springs were soldered in there, so I soldered these in there just to uh, keep with the original theme. And the re this wire here was re-soldered back in there. Uh, everything is nice and clean, and the action on the switch seems to be operating very smoothly. One thing I noticed back here was that uh, somebody had filled up this oil cup with grease. So now we're ready to move on to the next part. Okay, so I've gotten to the point of the restoration where I'm trying to deal with this front end bell. As you can see here, uh, at some point somebody took a grinder and was grinding this area. They ground down this area here and also inside here is all chewed away. Additionally, somebody drilled some extra holes inside there. Uh, this cavity is supposed to be filled up with oil to allow the ring oilers to lubricate the shaft. Instead, uh, this thing was completely filled up with grease. Uh, so I spent about the last 20 minutes so far trying to uh, get some of that grease out of there. I'm gonna go ahead and continue cleaning that until it's perfectly uh, free of any grease inside of there. And then uh, what I'm going to be doing is cosmetically uh, trying to make this look a little bit better and we'll fill in the holes that are not being used uh, so that oil isn't dribbling out of here. Uh, 
Also, it's gonna be necessary to make a gasket uh, to seal this up the correct way. So uh, this is where we're gonna be headed next in this project. Okay, so what I've done here is I plugged the six holes that were here from before. Um, some of them weren't very straight and uh, the other ones uh, were kind of stripped. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna rotate the switch a few degrees and we will drill and tap new holes uh, so that that switch is secured uh, properly. And also I'm gonna use some gasket material and we will cut a new gasket for this area here so that uh, it'll seal up any oil from dribbling out. Uh, the other thing that I'll do is before I install the gasket is uh, I will clean this area up and uh, I'll probably repaint this just this area right here uh, just for cosmetics just to give it a little bit of a uh, neater appearance. So what I've done here is I've drilled and tapped some new holes and I've also built up some JB weld around the areas that were ground away previously. Uh, this is strictly for looks, it doesn't have any structural value. Once the JB weld dries, I will grind that down and blend that in and make it look how it would have looked when it was new. So this is strictly for appearance. Okay, so the end bell is rebuilt, and uh, I feel confident that it's going to hold oil now the way that it should. We plugged the old holes, there were six holes total, plugged those, and then uh, I built up the edges here with just with JB Well, just for cosmetics, and now it looks exactly how it would have looked originally uh, before somebody started grinding away on it. And then we cut a new gasket, we got a new gasket under here, and we have the switch mounted, and then I re-soldered the... Uh, the leads here and have those coming out the top so that we can get to the next step. Uh, we're going to bring in the camera here and we'll let you take a look at the finished job in, in this area. So what I'm doing here on the base is I'm actually using a product called Stove Polish. And what that is is kind of like a wax that has uh, carbon in it. So uh, I'm going along the areas that do not have the original Japan finish and I'm uh, coating them up with that uh, black wax and then I'll be buffing that out. Uh, not only will it darken up those areas a little bit to help them blend in, but it, it will also provide a little bit of uh, rust protection as well. So. Uh, this product is actually made to use for uh, potbelly stoves, but uh, it is made for cast iron, so uh, we're trying it here and hopefully we'll have some good results. Okay, so now I'm going to begin the process of cleaning up the uh, finished surfaces on this Emerson. Uh, this Emerson was originally coated in a product known as Japani. Japani comes in a number of different recipes, but the primary ingredients are asphaltum, turpentine, and linseed oil. So uh, it's really a beautiful and durable finish. 
Uh, it has a nice sheen to it. It's not too shiny, not too dull. Uh, so I want to preserve that. Um, so what I'm going to do in order to accomplish that goal is I'm going to use some rubbing compound like you would use on your car. And we're just going to clean the surface. I'll do everything by hand. Uh, and then I'll use some polishing compound. Uh, this Flitz product here is pretty good. And then after it's all cleaned and polished, I'll protect it with some Johnson's Paste Wax. The, uh, the brass terminal blocks here, I've cleaned these and I've removed about 50% of the defects in there. I didn't want to take them down to a brand new surface. Um, I just want them to look uh, used but well preserved. So I just cleaned them up, took about 50% of the defects out of there so you could still see a little bit of the patina in there um, and didn't make them look brand new. Also, these mating surfaces here, need to make sure that those are clean. Uh, if there's any grit or anything like that in there, you could have a situation where the, uh, the shaft is sitting cockeyed in there. So we don't want that. So um, I'm gonna do all of this by hand. Okay, so I'm getting ready to uh, start putting the motor back together, at least the, uh, the big components of it. And in order to do that, I had to replace one of these fiber washers, uh, which was broken. Uh, have an assortment of those. Uh, if you're going to be serious about these electric motors, it's good to have an assortment kit of the fiber washers because you need these things all the time to uh, get the shaft uh, spaced appropriately. Also, I just made these little clamps just out of uh, some copper wire and what I'll do is I'll insert those to hold the centrifugal switch in the open position so that the contact on the end bell can slide in there uh, because otherwise the springs on the centrifugal switch will keep it closed and the end bell uh, will bang into it so these little pieces of wire will just keep that open also uh, when I'm installing the end bells I rotate them upside down first that allows the ring for the ring oiler to get out of the way, otherwise that'll keep falling down. Uh, so I put the end bell on upside down and then once I got that ring oiler uh, onto the shaft then I rotated it into the correct position.
Okay, so I had a uh, small little issue um, when I went to test the motor for the first time. I got it temporarily uh, hooked up there, and when I went to test it, I noticed that there were some sparks coming out of the uh, centrifugal switch. You know, in any project that I've done, it's not unusual for there to be some little adjustment that has to be made at the end or some little tweak that you have to do to get things running exactly right, and uh, this project was no different. So. Uh, while I was cleaning this thing up, I had installed some new springs uh, on the centrifugal switch, and uh, the springs were the same size, but they were just, just a little bit too strong. And so what was happening is the centrifugal switch was not able to open, and uh, consequently that was causing some sparking. So I took it apart, and I just put the old springs back in there, and uh, I gave it a quick test, and it seems to be working like a charm. I also have the oil baths filled up now, and what I'll be doing is I'll be going along and uh, making that wire uh, on the terminal blocks. I'll be making that more permanent and nicer looking. Uh, before I do that, I'm just going to go ahead and fire it up. And I'm going to clean up these shafts using a, uh, a metal file. So we're going to do that right now. Just cleaning up the shafts in the front and the back, just using the file. Good news is it's running. I also have the bats filled up with oil uh, just to get those ring oilers going. It seems like they should be working fine. There's a little oil dribbling out of these bats just because uh, I overfilled them just a little bit. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to shorten up these leads. Uh, make that look more aesthetically pleasing and then uh, I'll bring you guys back and we'll show you guys it, uh, the motor in its final form. Okay? Thanks. Okay, so the motor is finished, and I feel like it really came out looking fantastic. Uh, it looks well preserved, but it looks used, uh, as it should. In this, uh, in this project, we tried to do more of a conservation rather than a restoration, and uh, tried to keep the original look of the motor, and I think we accomplished that goal. Uh, a few things that happened off camera uh, was that, number one, I touched up a couple of the letters that were missing the gold paint. Uh, I still left a little wear and tear on there, but I just wanted to touch up the ones that were missing the paint completely, and uh, that came out looking pretty well. Uh, another thing that happened was when I was attaching these end bells for the last time, another bolt broke off. It was just kind of a weakened bolt. I wasn't really tightening it too strong. It just broke, and uh, so I had to get that out of the housing. I had to edit that out of the video because uh, I said a bad word. And also, on the uh, terminal block, I decided against putting any lettering on there. I was playing around with several different approaches. I was trying water slide decals, 
stickers. I tried making some little brass tags with a uh, letter punch set. And none of them really looked good. Uh, sometimes you just have to know when to say enough is enough. Um, the only satisfactory approach I think to doing that would be uh, silk screening it. And I'm not really set up to do that. So I just decided to leave, leave well enough alone and it looks fantastic just the way it is. So um, I think the thing is set up to run for another 100 years without any problems. The oil bats are working good, the ring oilers, all that stuff is working great. The centrifugal switch now is operating fine. Uh, everything is running good. So I appreciate you watching. I know this video was a little bit longer than my other ones, uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. And we look forward to seeing you the next time. Thank you very much for watching the video.